This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Nelson. Voodoo Planet by Andre Norton. Chapter 2 Lightning played along the black ridges above them, and below was a sheer drop to a river which was only a silver thread. Under their boots, man-made and yet dominating the wildness of jungle and mountain, was a platform of rock slabs, fused to support a palace of towering yellow-white walls and curved cups of domes. A palace which was also half-fortress, half-frontier post. Dane set his hands on the parapet of the river drop, blinked as a lightning bolt crackled in a sky-splitting glare of violet fire. This was about as far from the steaming islands of Zeko as a man could imagine. The demon Graz prepare for battle. Asaki nodded toward the distant crackling. Captain Jellicoe laughed. Supposed to be wetting their tusks, eh? I wouldn't care to meet a Graz that could produce such a display by mere tusk wetting. No, but think of the reward for the tracker who discovers where such go to die. To find the graveyard of the Graz herds would make any man wealthy beyond dreams. How much truth is there in that legend? Tao asked. The chief ranger shrugged. Who can say? This much is true. I have served my life in the forest since I could walk. I have listened to the talk of trackers, hunters, rangers in my father's courtyards and field camps since I could understand their words. Yet never has any man reported the finding of a body of a Graz that died a natural death. The scavengers might well account for the bulk of flesh, but the tusks and the bones should be visible for years. And this, too, I have seen with my own eyes. A Graz, close to death, supported by two of its kind and being urged along to the big swamps. Perhaps it is only that the suffering animal longs for water at its end, or perhaps in the heart of that morass there does lie the Graz graveyard. But no man has found a naturally dead Graz, nor has any returned from exploring the big swamps. Lightning on peaks which were like polished jet-bare rock above, the lush overgrowth of jungle below. And between, this fortress held by men who dared both the heights and the depths. The wildly burgeoning life of Katka had surrounded the off-worlders since they had come here. There was something untamable about Katka. The lush planet lured and yet repelled at the same time. Zaboru far from here? The chief ranger pointed north in answer to the captain's question. About a hundred leagues. It is the first new preserve we have prepared in ten years and it is our desire to make it the best for tri-d hunters. That is why we are now operating taming teams." "'Taming teams?' Dane had to ask. The chief ranger was ready enough to discuss his project. "'Zoboru is a no-kill preserve. The animals, they come to learn that after a while. But we cannot wait several years until they do. So we make them gifts.' He laughed evidently recalling some incident. Sometimes, perhaps, we are too eager. Most of our visitors who wish to make tridees want to picture big game. Graz, amplet, rock apes, lions. Lions? echoed Dane. Not Terran lions, no. But my people, when they landed on Katka, found a few animals that reminded them of those they had always known. So they gave those the same names. A Kotkin lion is furred. It is a hunter and a great fighter, but it is not the cat of Terra. However, it is in great demand as a tri-d actor. So we summon it out of lurking by providing free meals. One shoots a poli, a water rat, or a land deer, and drags the carcass behind a low-flying flitter. The lion springs upon the moving meat, which it can also scent, and the rope is cut, leaving a free dinner. The lions are not stupid. 
In a very short time they connect the sound of a flitter cutting the air with food. So they come to the banquet, and those on the flitter can take their tridy shots at ease. Only there must also be care taken in such training. One forest guard on the Komog preserve became too enterprising. He dragged his kill at first. Then, to see if he could get the lions to forget man's presence entirely, he hung the training carcasses on the flitter, encouraging them to jump for their food. For the guard that was safe enough, but it worked too, too well. A month or so later, a hunter was escorting a client through Komog, and they swung low to get a good picture of a water-rat emerging from the river. Suddenly there was a snarl behind them, and they found themselves sharing the flitter with a lioness, annoyed at finding no meat waiting on board. Luckily they both wore staff belts, but they had to land the flitter and leave until the lioness wandered off, and she seriously damaged the machine in her irritation. So now our guards play no more fancy tricks while on taming runs. Tomorrow, no, he corrected himself. The day after tomorrow, I will be able to show you how the process works. And tomorrow? inquired the captain. Tomorrow, my men make hunting magic. Asaki's voice was expressionless. Your chief witch doctor being? questioned Tao. Lambrillo. The chief ranger did not appear disposed to add to that, but Tao pursued the subject. His office is hereditary? Yes. Does that make any difference? For the first time there was a current of repressed eagerness in the other's tone. Perhaps a vast amount of difference, Tao replied. A hereditary office may carry with it two forms of conditioning, one to influence its holder, one to affect the public at large. Your Lumbrillo may have come to believe deeply in his own powers. He would be a very remarkable man if he did not. It is almost certain that your people unquestionably accept him as a worker of wonders. They do so accept. Once more Asaki's voice was drained of life. And Lombrillo does not accept something you believe necessary? Again the truth, medic. Lombrillo does not accept his proper place in the scheme of things. He is a member of one of your five families? No. His clan is small, always set apart. From the beginning here, those who spoke for gods and demons did not also order men." "'Separation of church and state,' commented Tao, thoughtfully. "'Yet in our Terran past there have been times when church and state were one. Does Lumbrillo desire that?' Asaki raised his eyes to the mountain peaks, to the northward where lay his beloved work. I do not know what Lumbrillo wants, save that it makes mischief, or worse. This I tell you. Hunting magic is part of our lives, and it has at its core some of the most unexplainable happenings which you have acknowledged do exist. I have used powers I can neither explain nor understand as part of my work. In the jungle, and on the grasslands, an off-worlder must guard his life with a stass belt if he goes unarmed. But I, any of my men, can walk unharmed if we obey the rules of our magic. Only Lumbrillo does other things which his forefathers did not. And he boasts that he can do more. So he has a growing following of those who believe, and those who fear. You want me to face him? The chief ranger's big hands closed upon the rim of the parapet as if they could exert enough pressure to crumble the hard stone. I want you to see whether there is trickery in this. Trickery I can fight. For that there are weapons. But if Lumbrillo truly controls forces for which there is no name, then perhaps we must patch up an uneasy peace, or go down in defeat. And, off-worlder, I come from a line of warriors. We do not drink defeat easily. That I also believe, Tao returned quietly. Be sure, sir, if there is trickery in this man's magic and I can detect it, the secret shall be yours. Let us hope that so it shall be. Subconsciously, 
Dane had always associated the practice of magic with darkness and the night. But the next morning the sun was high and hot when he made one of the party coming down to a second and larger walled terrace, where the hunters, trackers, guards, and other followers of the chief ranger were assembled in irregular rows. There was a low sound which was more a throb in the clear air about them, getting into a man's blood and pumping in rhythm there. Dane tracked the sound to its source. Four large drums standing waist-high before the men who tapped them delicately with the tips of all ten fingers. The necklaces of claws and teeth about those dusky throats, the kilts of fringed hide, the crossed belts of brilliantly spotted or striped fur, were in contrast to the very efficient and modern sidearms each man wore, to the rest of the equipment sheathed and strapped at their belts. There was a carved stool for the chief ranger, another for Captain Jellicoe. Dane and Tao settled themselves on the less comfortable seats of the terrace steps. Those tapping fingers increased their rate of beat, and the notes of the drums rose from the low murmur of hived bees to the mutter of mountain thunder still half a range away. A bird called from those inner courts of the palace from which the women never ventured. Da, 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 da. Voices took up the thud, thud of the drums. The heads of the squatty men moved in a slow swing from side to side. Tao's hand closed about Dane's wrist, and the younger man looked around, startled, to see that the medic's eyes were alight, that he was watching the assembly with the alertness of Sinbad approaching prey. Calculate the stowage space in number one hold. That amazing order, delivered in a whisper, shocked Dane into obeying it. Number one hold. There were three divisions now, and the stowage was... He became aware that for a small space of time he had escaped the net being woven by the beat of the drum, the drone of voices, the nodding of heads. He moistened his lips. So that was how it worked. He had heard Tao speak often enough about self-hypnotism under such conditions, but this was the first time the meaning of it had been clear. Two men were shuffling out of nowhere, wearing nothing on their dark bodies but calf-length kilts of tails, black tails with fluffy white tips, which swayed uniformly in time to their pacing feet. Their heads and shoulders were masked by beautifully cured and semi-mounted animal heads, displaying half-open jaws with double pairs of curved fangs. The black-and-white striped fur, the sharply pointed ears, were neither canine nor feline, but a weird combination of the two. Dane gabbled two trading formulas under his breath, and tried to think of the relation of seventeen rock coinage to galactic credits. Only this time his defenses did not work. From between the two shuffling dancers padded something on four feet. The canine feline creature was more than just a head. It was a loose-limbed, graceful body fully eight feet in length, and the red eyes and the prick-eared head were those of a confident killer. It walked without restraint, lazily, with arrogance, its white tufted tail swinging. And when it reached the midpoint of the terrace, it flung up its head as if to challenge. But words issued from between those curved fangs. Words which Dane might not understand, but which undoubtedly held meaning for the men nodding in time to the hypnotic cadence of that da, da, da. Beautiful! Tao spoke in honest admiration, his own eyes almost as feral as those of the talking beast as he leaned forward, his fists on his knees. Now the animal was dancing also, its paws following the pace set by the massed attendants. It must be a man in an animal skin. But Dane could hardly believe that. The illusion was too perfect. His own hands went to the knife sheath at his belt. Out of deference to local custom, they had left their stun rods in the palace. But a belt knife was an accepted article of apparel. Dane slid the blade out surreptitiously, setting its point against the palm of his hand and jabbing painfully. This was another of Tao's answers for breaking a spell. 
but the white and black creature continued to dance. There was no blurring of its body lines into those of a human being. It sang on in a high-pitched voice, and Dane noted that those of the audience nearest the stools where Asaki and the captain were seated now watched the chief ranger and the space officer. He felt Tau tense beside him. Trouble coming. The warning from Tau was the merest thread of sound. Dane forced himself to look away from the swaying cat-dog, to watch instead the singers who were now furtively eyeing their lord and his guest. The Terran knew that there were feudal bonds between the ranger and his men. But suppose this was a showdown between Lumbrillo and Asaki. Whose side would these men take? He watched Captain Jellicoe's hand slide across his knee, his fingers drop in touching distance of knife-hilt. And the hand of the chief ranger, hanging lax at his side, suddenly balled into a fist. So! Tau expelled the word as a hiss. He moved with sure-footed speed. Now he passed between the stools to confront the dancing cat-dog. Yet he did not look at that weird creature and its attendants. Instead, his arms were flung high as if to ward off, or perhaps welcome, something on the mountainside as he shouted, Hodi! El Dama! Hodi! As one, those on the terrace turned, looked up toward the slope. Dane was on his feet, holding his knife as he might a sword. Though of what use its puny length would be against that huge bulk moving in slow majesty toward them, he did not try to think. Gray-dark trunk curled upward between great ivory tusks. Ears went wide as ponderous feet crunched volcanic soil. Tao moved forward, his hand still upraised, clearly in greeting. That trunk touched skyward as if in salute to the man who could be crushed under one foot. Hodi! El Dama! For the second time Tao hailed the monster elephant, and the trunk raised in silent greeting from one lord of an earth to another he recognized as an equal. Perhaps it had been a thousand years since man and elephant had stood so, and then there had been only war and death between them. Now there was peace, and a current of power flowing from one to the other. Dane sensed this, saw the men on the terrace likewise drawing back from the unseen tie between the medic and the bull he had so clearly summoned. Then Tao's upheld hands came together in a sharp clap, and the men held their breath in wonder. Where the great bull had stood there was nothing except rocks in the sun. As Tao swung around to face the cat-dog, that creature had no substance either, for he fronted no animal but a man, a small, lean man whose lips wrinkled back from his teeth in a snarl. His attendant priest fell back, leaving the spaceman and the witch-doctor alone. Lombrilo's magic is great, Tao said evenly. I hail Lombrilo of Katka. His hand made the open palm salute of peace. The snarl faded as the man brought his face under control. He stood naked, but he was clothed in inherent dignity. And there was power with that dignity, power and a pride before which even the more physically impressive chief ranger might have to give place. "'You have magic also, Outlander,' he replied. "'Where walks this long-toothed shadow of yours now?' "'Where once the men of Katka walked, Lumbrilo. "'For it was men of your blood who long, long past hunted this shadow of mine "'and made its body their prey. "'So that it now might have a blood debt to settle with us, Outlander? "'That you set, not I, man of power.' You have shown us one beast, I have shown another. Who can say which of them is stronger when it issues forth from the shadows? Lombrilo pattered forward, his bare feet making little sound on the stones of the terrace. Now he was only an arm's length away from the medic. You have challenged me, off-world man. Was that a question or a statement? Dane wondered. Why should I challenge you, Lombrillo? 
to each race its own magic. I come not to offer battle." His eyes held steady with the Kotkins. "'You have challenged me.' Lombrido turned away and then looked back over his shoulder. "'The strength you depend upon may become a broken staff, Offworlder. Remember my words in the time when shadows become substance, and substance the thinnest of shadows.'" End of chapter 2